you know, a traditional cloud platform, you're going to go in, you're going to put your credit card in there, you're going to put your PayPal or, or whatever that looks like, but you're, you know, putting in your personal details, you're going through that kind of KYC check, you're then spinning it up to those, those, um, that infrastructure. Um, whereas you've got this whole blockchain space now where people want tokens um, and those developers may want to, you know, rather than having to convert out their earnings from their tokens of however they've, you know, earned them, um, they want to just be able to spend, you know, in that currency. So it's like, how can we just provide a more native way that is familiar to um, to, to Web3 or how the Web3 world wants to go? So kind of combining those two elements really is 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 how we um, it came up with the Kudos blockchain as a, as the kind of the base layer that was needed uh, because there was you know some customizations, but the base layer that was needed um, to be able to then uh, execute the strategy, which is providing scalable compute to the blockchain ecosystem. This podcast is sponsored by Coin ATM Radar. When buying crypto with cash, an ATM is much more reliable and safer than meeting some random person in a random place. And unlike an exchange, which could freeze your account, you truly own all the crypto you buy. With Coin ATM Radar, you could find crypto ATMs and other services where you can buy and sell cryptocurrencies for cash. On their website, you can search by coin, address, if the ATM supports selling as well as buying, and you can also search by geo area, country, state, city. You can also check and compare actual current fees at different ATMs. If you want to find out more, head over to coinatmradar.com, which is C O I N A T M R A D A R.com. Hey everyone, I have the fantastic pleasure of speaking with the one and only Pete Hill today. How's it going, man? Uh, it's going really well, thank you very much. I'll, it's, uh, it's a pleasure to be here, so pleasure's mine. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and as we were mentioning, um, kind of in the uh, in the pre-recorded part of this, um, uh, we kind of know each other through uh, Scott Cunningham, who's been on this channel quite a few times, and I've been on his a couple times. And um, he definitely he suggested I I reach out to um, to someone from Kudos and you know kind of get to explore that. So I'm definitely down for that. And um, also, as I mentioned as well. I've been sort of starting to expro- expand my horizons into the the cosmos verse as well, and so just all of that is very interesting. So, uh, why don't you just start out really quick? Um, who you are? Um, how'd you got into crypto and all that? Yeah, sure. Okay, so so I'm Pete. Um, people call me Kudo Pete. If you want to look up my Telegram handle or uh, X handle, I'm not I'm not quite used to saying X yet. Are you? I'm not sure about that. Uh, I'm not either, but no, I, I know whenever I type X.com, it resolves to Twitter.com. So yeah, I think yeah. we, we all get a pass for calling it the wrong thing for a while <laughs> now. Just doesn't quite roll off the tongue, but anyhow. Um, but yeah, Kudo Pete uh, across those uh, those mediums, if you like. Um, so who am I? So I'm one of the co-founders at uh, Kudos. Um, so we're a layer one blockchain that's built in the, the Cosmos ecosystem, which is one of the reasons why you, uh, you have me here today. So we'll go into that a little bit more. Mm-hmm. Um, but what are we what are we actually doing as a as a project? Um, is we are creating a scalable computing ecosystem, uh, if you like. So. You know, if you're if you're a DAP developer, if you're a layer one protocol that needs infrastructure to run, you know, validator nodes on, um, if you're platform metaverse, blockchain, I mean, any of those kind of things that, you know, the common thing is everything needs computing infrastructure underneath the hood. Um, and, you know, we saw that as uh, there's very limited options within the kind of blockchain space. So, you know, don't get me wrong, we're not the only ones. There are others that are kind of going into the decentralized computing, distributed computing uh, as well. But there's limited options compared to the kind of more traditional world where you've got Amazon, AWS and uh, Microsoft Azure, etc. So so that's that's kind of what we wanted to bring to the, the table. Uh, we've spent uh, the last kind of 20 years uh, within the cloud space industry. So we've come from that kind of old traditional set and we wanted to kind of move that into into the web free space. Um, and, um, you know, how that looks differently is because there's a kind of there's a there's a couple of things right within the web free space is that we all got into this because we believe in decentralization and we believe in you know, a fairer way to do things. How can we how can we, you know, 
uh, how can everyone have a chance of being able to benefit from from these from these new networks? So, so there's kind of a piece there, and I'm sure we'll we'll chat about you know how we're planning to get to that um, full decentralization point as we go through. Um, the other part is is that people want to connect in a different way now. So, you know, a traditional cloud platform, you're going to go in, you're going to put your credit card in there, you're going to put your PayPal or, or whatever that looks like, but you're, you know, putting in your personal details, you're going through that kind of KYC check, you're then spinning it up to those, those, um, that infrastructure. Um, whereas you've got this whole blockchain space now where people own tokens um, and those developers may want to, you know, rather than having to convert out their earnings from their tokens of however they've, you know, earned them, um, they want to just be able to spend, you know, in that currency. So it's like, how can we just provide a more native way that is familiar to um, to, to Web3 or to how the Web3 world wants to go. So kind of combining those two elements really is 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 how we um, it came up with the Kudos blockchain as, a, as the kind of the base layer that was needed uh, because there was, you know, some customizations, but the base layer that was needed um, to be able to then uh, execute the strategy, which is providing scalable compute to the blockchain ecosystem. Yeah, fantastic. Well, uh... Let me hit on the Cosmos thing ahead of time because um, obviously it's something that I'm very interested in as well. But also, I get a lot of my my audiences might be more you know purely from the digital cash focused thing as I'm slowly kind of like thrusting all this the greater crypto world onto them. You know, it's sort of a, a collective learning process, right? Um, so one reason you know, I mean, the easiest way you know that Bitcoin is significant is because it was the first. Um, and it's still top of the market caps. Um, another way you really know is just how many Bitcoin-based projects there are as far as like the code base has is, is lived on. And the same thing can kind of apply for Ethereum where, you know, Ethereum, there's everything is EVM. Um, you could argue that it's even greater than the Bitcoin ecosystem at this point. Mm -hmm. um, and then when you start to look up like, okay, zero knowledge proofs, okay, Zcash has clearly pioneered some really cool things in this um, mm -hmm domain and there's a whole bunch of things and so it's kind of like based on you can't pay attention to everything but you can pay attention to significant projects and i kind of never got cosmos in the beginning i just didn't pay attention to be honest and then i started to notice that a whole lot of projects especially ones i liked were based on cosmos and so um it kind of you know now i'm interested so um i don't know how much how deep you are into the cosmos world but do you want to briefly explain, you know, what Cosmos is? How yeah. is it kind of different from Ethereum, and then the whole um, the whole IBC thing? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, so, well, okay, let's take you on an adventure and jump into yeah. the Cosmos, right? <laughs> absolutely, um, rocket ship. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, yeah, there's it, it's it's something that we actually spend a lot of time kind of doing our research. Um, on is you know there's, there's probably different ways that we can we can look at this but if I if I start in this order so you know when we were looking to build a blockchain because of what 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 we are doing on the compute side which is what I alluded to first um, there wasn't anything at the time that was around that allowed us to uh, essentially build on top of that um, that existing chain, if you like, mm -hmm. and be able to deliver um, our kind of compute strategy. So I won't get too much into the, the, the details of that. So we knew that we had to build either a layer one from scratch ourselves, which is something we did, really didn't want to do, um, or we were going to have to build on another layer one and, and heavily um, uh, customize it. Or we could use something like Cosmos, where they're, they're a layer zero, and I'll explain what that may, means in a moment, um, but they've got, already got all of those Lego bricks. So we can take those Lego bricks and we can, you know, we can build our layer one in a, in a very kind of modular uh, way. Uh, but that, that you know, 90% of that work has already been done essentially, which means that we can add that 10% customization. It's going to save a lot of time, but it also means that we're going to then benefit from um, the, the Cosmos ecosystem in this case, from that Lego brick ecosystem, um, because there's a lot of standardization in there. Um, there's uh, a lot of interoperability um, in there as well, which is really important for what we're looking to do. Um, there's already, uh, you know, a, a tried, tested uh, consensus mechanism, uh, and so on and so forth. Right. So that's kind of that was uh, that was really was the kind of decision we uh, went down, and we we looked at a different a, a few different kind of 
layer, zero, layer zero ecosystems of where we could build our own layer one. So, you know, Polkadot came into it. It was before Avalanche, really. So, you know, uh, or Avalanche was really just at a very, very early stage. So um, we, we kind of skipped over that. So we, we kind of landed back to, um, to, to, to Cosmos. So the way I, I, I describe it, and and um, I just want to caveat: this is this is not my analogy, right? I am stealing this yeah, from someone else. I can't remember who it was, but it but it you know it does. I, I have remembered it, you know, since uh, since that person mentioned it. But you know, think of a layer zero as like your street, right? Your residential street, and then the layer one is the is the foundation of each house, right? So that street is the fabric that is connecting all of those foundations. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, but those foundations are the kind of layer one, which is what is then developed on, is what is built on uh, on top of. So all of those kind of dApps, um, uh, etc., are the are the uh, are the houses on top of those foundations, right? So that's kind of how that's how I, I think of it. So Cosmos is, is is similar to that. It's the street, right? It's this hub where um, it's the uh, everything is is like a fabric underneath it, right? Which provides all that standardization, provides that interoperability, and then you've got all of these layer ones that are built on top, including ourselves, Secret Network. Um, uh, you know, even one of the Binance chains is 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 on there as well, and Osmosis, and 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 so on and so forth. So it's a really bustling ecosystem as well, um, and it's very very developer heavy, very developer centric. Mm-hmm. Um, and that kind of played into in, into our decision there. But I think, you know, real really kind of testament to, um, to, to Cosmos is, you know, it's been well documented that there have been issues with the Solana ecosystem going down, blockchain going down, you know, and having outages. And I wouldn't say that's necessarily unusual, right? Everyone is still fairly nascent within, um, uh, within, this, within this technology. Um, but then if you come across to the cosmos, you know, even when Terra um, collapsed or Luna collapsed, you know, um, it's, it, it, um, you know, there's that massive, in effect, run on the bank where everyone was, you know, cashing out as quickly as possible. Imagine how many transactions were happening at that point and the level of, of activity was happening on the network. The network was uninterrupted and, and it coped with it and there were no bottlenecks and, and stuff like that. So it's, it's been designed really, really well. Um, the difference really to, uh, apart from being a layer zero and Ethereum being a layer one, you know, the, the difference is to um, a big ecosystem like Ethereum, which uh, a lot more people will be familiar with, is, um, you know, Ethereum has moved from proof of work to proof of stake as a consensus mechanism. Mm-hmm. And the Cosmos chains are all proof of stake as well. So that's a similarity. Um, but uh, the way that that proof of stake is set up is is actually quite different so mm-hmm. you know on ethereum there's still um i believe in the kind of tens of thousands of validator nodes that need to um uh, to, to operate to, to kind of support that network whereas in the cosmos um ecosystem the consensus mechanism that we uh, use is called tendermint um and tendermint is ha- has this uh, byzantine fault tolerance um is, is the kind of methodology that's been um integrated into it um, and so the, 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 the upper advised limit of validators uh, within, that, that, um, within that network is, is actually 100 per, per chain. So there are, the, you know, there, there, are some, um, there are some slight deviations from that where um, some of the layer ones that are built there have kind of customized it to increase the validator set. But in general, it's, it's a much smaller set of validators that's required to form the backbone um, of those networks as well. So it just means it's really lean, very, very quick, supports the high transactions, uh, supports low cost, um, so supports the high transactional throughput, should I say, supports mm-hmm. the low transactional costs. Um, um, and that makes it very appealing for um, anything that needs to run, you know, thousands and thousands of microtransactions, which is absolutely what, you know, we intend to do as we, we scale into yeah, this. Naturally. Of people buy and selling compute. Yeah. yeah and so, um, if you could touch a little bit on IBC, I don't know exactly how deep you are into it. I've had people much smarter than me explain it. And I think I, I feel like I 70, maybe 80% get it, but, um, <laughs> there's that little extra that maybe, who knows? Maybe you can offer a different perspective. But yeah, so IBC or inter-blockchain um, connectivity or compatibility—I forget which one it is. Yes, yeah, so it's the, the inter-blockchain communication protocol. 
and so <laughs> IBC and uh, it's quite funny because if you put IBC into Google you're going to get like 40 different uh, versions of that acronym from all different types of industries <laughs> yeah of um, course. So it's quite, quite commonly used but yeah I, IBC is the Interblockchain Communication Protocol it was created by the Interchain Foundation which is a key uh, component it's a key partner within the, the Cosmos ecosystem Mm -hmm. um, they helped to develop the Tendermint um, uh, consensus mechanism um, as yeah, well. Yeah, of course. Um, but it's yeah, it's it's effectively um, a protocol that allows interoperability between all of the chains that are IBC enabled. So within the Cosmos system, what you want to do, what you do, if we wanted to, um, um, you know, uh, if we wanted to work close with Juno, for example, or Secret mm -hmm. and one of the other is we set up a relayer between ourselves and then we're IBC compatible between each other. So we don't need to go write some, some custom protocol or anything like that ourselves. We don't have to go build a bridge, um, you know, which is what you're seeing between other other networks. We we simply have a, a kind of relayer in place and then we can use the, the existing uh, IBC uh, protocol. So that means that if we look at the kind of Cosmos ecosystem, I think there's around about, you know, 100, somewhere between 100, 150 uh, layer ones within there. Um, that gives us a huge amount of uh, uh, layer one protocols that we can be interoperable with, right? With, with relatively uh, little amount of work to do. do. And, that, and that was kind of one of the reasons why um, we, again, we chose Cosmos because IBC wasn't ready at that point, but it was something that they had written a white paper about and they were starting to develop. And we saw that, we kind of placed our bets on it and saw that as the future of interoperability between chains. So even though that was, you know, very much um, designed to start within the cosmos, mm -hmm. what's actually happened now is, you know, near protocol outside the cosmos were, I, th I believe, were the first ones to, to kind of test it and implement it. Ethereum has successfully tested it now as well. So, it, so IBC is quickly becoming um, the, the kind of standard um, uh, um, across, you know, inside and outside of the cosmos, across the, the wider blockchain ecosystem. Um, which is, you know, which will be fantastic when we once we've got that standardization. It's the way I, the way that I would um, kind of draw parallels to a previous kind of technology of of similar type, right? Of ter in, in terms of what it's uh, delivering, um, is if you go back to the kind of early '90s um, and the internet, mm -hmm. you had all these separate telco networks that were set up um and um you know there, there was it was that isolation so very much like the early blockchains you had all these like kind of separate siloed islands if you like um and nothing to to connect them together so you know someone came out with tcp ip uh, as a protocol uh, back in the, i believe it was the early 90s i might have my dates wrong so yeah. mm -hmm. Uh, don't quote me on that. Um, have a look. Do your own research. <laughs> but, you know, TCP IP was a way to standardize all that and, make, and mean that any of these telco networks could communicate with, 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 with each other. And that's that's where we feel um, or how we felt and why we made a decision about Cosmos because of the, the, the IPC protocol and uh, what it would bring to the network. Yeah, it was fantastic. So uh, with IPC, with actually bridging a token from one chain to another, um, how how easy is that process? It's it's very easy. I wouldn't be able to give you the full kind of technical mm -hmm. rundown uh, on exactly how that works. Um, but it's not like a it's not like a bridge, um, like a like a wormhole, for example, uh, which is you know a very commonly used bridge where there's a kind of liquidity pool that's um, mm -hmm. you know at the middle or or, or sat either end. Um, it's more you know that is going. It's it's rooting via. Um, uh, a dex potentially where that's get, that's being uh, swapped in real time, but the, the the instruction is is being agreed at both ends. So if I've got you know uh, chain number one over here and kudos over here, and we're doing a transaction between each mm -hmm. other, you know we're doing that verification between each other. So there's that message in that's saying I'm sending you this, thank you for your message. I confirm that I'm going to receive it, and you send a message back. So that's kind of where I draw the the, the analogy with TCP/IP, but. Um, you know, within that, there's a swap that's happening on a, on a kind of DEX to, to make that happen. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, so now let's dive into Kudos more specifically. And so basically, um, really quick, what kind of um, overarching problem are you trying to solve? Would you mind describing the problem and then how you're trying to solve it? 
Yeah, so so uh, I guess within the if we if we stick specifically to this kind of web free space and what we're looking to solve is is it's just a very limited amount of options for mm-hmm. um, uh, infrastructure which is suitable to um, web three developers, right? And I'm not just talking about from a um, topology point of view or infrastructure type, but I'm actually talking about from a philosophical point of view as well. Yeah, right. So it, it's, uh, you know, we well, we are all big believers of decentralization, as, as you know, as I mentioned right at the beginning. Um, you know, that's why people have come into Web3, because we believe there is a, there is a, a new way that we can own our own data. Um, you know, that the, the, we are the, the masters of our own destiny in, in, in that kind of sense. Right. Um, and we believe that the, the the whole world should be included in this, right? Not just the the few big tech companies and, and stuff like that, right? So, so that that's the kind of what has all driven us into this this kind of web free space, or a lot of us into this web free space, definitely ourselves. Um, but then we look at that and we say, right, you've got um, these layer ones that have been building, and you know, a lot of the a lot of those kind of um, bigger layer ones, proof of stakes. The Ethereum's, the Solana's. There was a point until you know fairly recently where, in some cases, over seventy percent of their core network was in AWS. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, a, a big centralized uh, cloud company. And so, what happens if you know? Okay, it's it's very unlikely. But what happens if AWS goes offline completely? You've lost your network, yeah. right? And that, and that has happened. You know, there was there was. You know, um, you know, a couple of years ago, you had WhatsApp, Meta, um, Instagram mm-hmm. going down because of you know outages um, on the on the Amazon network and stuff. So, you know, so um, that was a that was kind of that shows there was kind of limited options in the web free space. So, so how can we do that differently, right? So how can we? Yeah. Connect- so sorry to interject on that, but basically, um, a lot of these um, projects they don't necessarily need such a service at all. It's they could run a bare metal node, for example, that just kind of connects and does it's its own server. But just for scale and convenience sake, everyone just uses something like AWS instead. Is correct. that kind of correct? Yeah, yeah, I, I, absolutely. It's um, yeah, it's a convenience thing. Yeah, as you mm-hmm. mentioned, it's a convenience thing. So um, and so there's this that kind of element to it. So you've, you've had the lower, layer one protocols build, then you've had like the the DeFi season. Um, uh, which is the first real kind of use case um, on top of, you know, that's built in in smart contracts, DeFi came in, then you've had NFTs and you've had, you know, Metaverse, Autumn and all these different seasons and that, right? And the the, the, the the thing about them is they're all applications and they're all going to need computing power and they're all still going out and putting it on AWS or, you know, mm-hmm. or Google Cloud or, or, or so on and so forth. So, you know, how can we uh, solve that problem and, 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 and bring a an actual Web3 computing platform um, that is, uh, um, you know, better suited, that, that kind of native Web3 experience, but also the way that that's being distributed um, over multiple different service providers now, but, you know, that will move out towards the edge and consumer edge devices as well in the future to get gradually to get more decentralized as, uh, as we um, um, you know, as we scale the network and we overcome technical milestones and stuff. So, like I say, right at the beginning, we're not the only ones. There are other um, uh, there are other projects within this space that um, uh, are you know achieving the same thing. You know, you've got your kind of render network is very well known. You've got a cache network, which is also a Cosmos chain, by the way. So you know, in there. Um, you've got uh, Gensing, so there's a few a few others coming in, but it's, it's it's a limited amount, and the amount of computing power that's being consumed is just growing and growing and growing exponentially, mm-hmm. especially with the explosion of AI and you know kind of other compute intensive workloads. Um, but when you compare kind of you know kind of traditional computing, I guess if you want to call it that now, mm-hmm. you know that infrastructure as a service market is growing at around about 23% year on year. That's probably gone up now because of the um, uh, the AI explosion. But blockchain is growing at a quicker rate than that. It's still a it's still it's still a tiny fraction because it's a much much newer technology. But it's but the growth rate is quicker, and that transition from Web two to Web three is happening. So you know we wanted to make sure that 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 foundation is there to uh, to, to to make sure that you know that there there is an option out there for the Web three developers to be able to to access that scalable compute in the way they wanted to. So that's that's the problem that we. We set out to to, to solve. Um, we launched Kudos into Cloud 
fairly recently, which is that um, it's that web free front, front end. So that's scalable compute. So that went live in around about January time. Um, and quite simply put, you connect your wallet, in this case, Kepler initially, but we're going to be mm -hmm. adding MetaMask as well. Um, and that's already done the, the kind of verification of funds because that sees um, the balance you top up with Kudos token. Um, and then you can build your machines in a permissionless way. So there's no KYC, there's no personal details that, that need to go into that. So that's that's the kind of change. That's what the the, the native Web3 way of interacting with it is. Is That's what you know I'm kind of alluding to when I, when, when I mentioned that. And then we'll add further token support as well. So um, users in other blockchains will be able to, to use the token that's native to them. Yeah, for sure. It's so that... Um... At that stage, it's sort of like when you go to be a cloud computing customer or whatever else, you usually go to Amazon, you do all that kind of stuff. But instead of that, you just now access it in a sort of Web3 way using Kudos token, obviously a cryptocurrency and all that in order to just interact with the whole whole system. And so yeah. it just kind of supplants that. Is that correct? Yeah, it's correct. And underneath the hood, right? So once you've gone through that, that kind of payment front end, because that's the kind of Web3 experience, underneath the hood for us personally it's a distributed cloud computing network mm -hmm. um so that distributed means that we are scaling infrastructure on multiple different vendors all around the world right so we're not we're not putting it into we're not putting it into aws or azure or gcp or the hyperscalers mm -hmm. because actually they're at a premium and so that kind of defeats the object of what we're trying to achieve here um you know what we're doing is we're actually um you know bringing on suppliers all around the world that are coming from um you know remote regions but they're also coming from the main traffic hub region so we have that that kind of split footprint we're bringing on you know uh, uh high performance computing um uh service providers that have got lots of the the kind of gpu hardware that's required for this the complicated kind of ai uh, parallel workloads and um you know i suppose we could even look at kind of maybe even generative AI for kind of NFT creation or something like that, if we wanted to kind of give it more of a, a kind of, um, you know, a, a, a blockchain work um, use case. Um, um, but we're mixing that with the kind of traditional data center type locations in the main traffic hubs, because, um, you know, for, for, for a lot of the uh, applications that are building, they're still going to need that, uh, that latency sensitivity. So that latency just means the speed between the server and the customer that's interacting with the server. And that needs to, in some cases, like if you're playing a game, for example, that needs to be a, 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 um, a low latency for, for a really good experience. So we've had to kind of blend that footprint. So, you know, right now we're up to around about 11 or 12 unique uh, locations. And that's coming from around, I think it's like seven or eight unique uh, vendors, but that's going to scale, um, you mm -hmm. know, uh, quickly. That already gives us a really, really good uh, base of, you um, uh, resources there that's um, that's now available through kudos into cloud but that's just going to keep scaling and scaling and scaling and like i mentioned at the beginning the idea is that you know once we've built that first um uh, set of uh suppliers to the network is then we look to how can we bring on um more consumer edge devices so you're kind of gaming consoles pcs those um uh, mm -hmm. other connected devices and it gradually makes it more and more uh, decentralized um, so the most common question I always get is, well, why haven't you done that to, to, to begin with, right? And the, the reason mm -hmm. being is because the, um, you know, when we've been building up the uh, kind of uh, opportunities, speaking with the, the, the developers um, that are ultimately going to be the ones that are consuming this, they still need a lot of that computing power to be kind of tightly clustered together with very high bandwidth with high uptime mm -hmm. uh, guarantees, with, you know, with high security in, in place in a physical sense. And so, you know, um, the majority of that opportunity is still at this moment going into the kind of data center type facilities. But rather than us relying on one provider, like I said, we have multiple providers and that creates the distributed network. So it's kind of a step one towards that kind of democratized uh, cloud, if you like. Yeah, so if we were to sort of compare structurally with like an AWS type of thing. Mm -hmm. It's right now like a blockchain front end to sort of a corollary in that um, these kinds of data centers have been handpicked as it were. And then at some point that's going to be, all right, now it's open participation. Now anyone can run their own in front, participate in this. But like right now you want to start with a, a solid functional foundation and then let the, the decentralized elements kind of go in. 
Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I, I think I think the other thing is is sustainability is really, really important to us. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, one of the reasons why we set this this business up, because in the in the previous business, we our main uh, customer was cloud service providers themselves. Right. We were spe we were providing the space and power to them as was the was the primary service and we just saw a lot of underutilization so that was one of the kind of inspirations for kudo was like how can we utilize all of that um that that spare capacity right and tap into to that because that in itself um has a has a good um positive carbon impact in insofar that when you are building servers that's the that's the that's the most intensive part that's the biggest carbon footprint actually comes from the building the server rather than the, the running mm -hmm. of the server afterwards so um so how can we tap into the spare capacity now that that's it, things have kind of evolved because of this explosion of ai and the, and the demand on s certain gpus where actually there isn't any spare ones of those right so, mm -hmm. so you know what what do we look at so a lot of the supplies that we brought onto our network um and and, and this accounts for all of the supplies that are providing gpus are renewable energy powered um mm -hmm. or have a very high percentage of renewable energy powered and they might have some clean energy in there like nuclear or uh, some kind of uh, innovative gas flare in type mm -hmm. thing where we vein out of the air. So that's been a, and convert to electricity. So that's been a big, big focus on from from us is focusing on um, you know which of these service providers are renewable energy powered. That gets more difficult when you start going out to consumer devices like gaming PCs and stuff because they're you know they're plugged into um, a, you know the, the the local grid and that grid is going to have a mix of fossil fuel and renewables and, uh, and so forth. So we need to work that piece out you know is it uh, an offsetting thing uh, you know that that piece needs to be worked out and uh, fleshed out which is why again another reason why we started with the kind of data center type locations first yeah of course and it's like there's only so many problems you could solve at once already yeah solving yeah. the core of you know decentralized cloud thing is is massive and so being able to do that in any way is kind of a, a good thing yeah yeah, absolutely. Yeah, there's, there's lots of problems to solve with there. Uh, yeah, it's timing. <laughs> yeah, of course. And so now, just from like this, the structural perspective of um, outages, let's just say. So with AWS um, or something, and again, keeping on throwing in the the, the boogeyman, like the the bank corollary, except for the data center thing. Um, if there's just an outage, then everything goes down. Everyone who um, supplies, everyone who counts on that goes down. Uh, what's the kind of outage resistance uh, provided by something like Kudos, both today and then also when you when the whole decentralizing the infrastructure part happens? Yeah, sure. So if you, if you were to go into to Kudos into cloud, um, uh, you know you can because we've got multiple locations. What you can actually do is when you're customizing, so when you're building your virtual machine specification. Mm -hmm. You can save that as a template, right? So once you built it, you can save that as a template. That means if you want to spin up another one with the same uh, specification, is that you just build it from the template again. So you press on that, and it's going to auto um, auto build it. Um, but you, but importantly, you can choose a different location there, right? So um, the Kudo compute itself, the 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 uh, and and Kudo's intercloud, which is the kind of web pre interface um, to mm -hmm. that, is is um, you know is separate from any of those. Um, provider environments. So if any one of those providers go down, um, then, you know, you can still access uh, Kudos into cloud or, or the mm. other um, uh, network there. Um, and so in that case, you'll be able to, you know, click from template and bring the virtual machine up uh, in another location um, uh, during that during that period. Now, um, that will get more sophisticated over time, and you'll be able to, you know, be auto able to automatically redistribute based on the kind of configs you put in. So if you if you're putting if you're setting up something for like high availability, um, then you know um, the, the functionality will be there over time. So it does that automated um, in an automated way. But um, having said that, you know, we have got customers that will be doing something similar like that because we've we've added uh, tools like Terraform. Uh, which allow this kind of functionality to be uh, to to be built on the on the on the customer end as well. So, um, yeah, there's again, that's that's just one of the big benefits of, of being a distributed network is that you know we have these different underlying service provider environments. So if one goes down, you know you have got unless it's you know some in multiple uh, multiple ones in the same country and they have this you know country blackout for example. But that's mm -hmm. again. We've, we've made sure that we've got different countries on board, different geographies around the world, different underlying vendors. So you have this kind of layer of redundancy and resilience in place that's available to you. 
Yeah, I mean that's pretty uh, pretty fascinating. Uh, now when we're talking about um, sort of the hard questions of decentralization, censorship resistance, and structure. So first of all, um, obviously as a Cosmos base chain, it's pretty. You already laid out the the basic structure of like staking nodes, etc. Um, now as far as the actual like development and running of the team and stuff, what's the structure of that? Have you got a DAO or something? Is it currently sort of a company type setup on top of that? What are, and then what are the kind of plans around that? And then also like token, initial token distribution and stuff, just those yeah. fun things. Yeah, I mean, if, if anyone wants to have a look at our existing tokenomics, they can you know, just search the, the Kudos white paper in Google. Um, it's, it's always the quickest mm -hmm. way to find a document, by the way. So, so you know, just uh, put it into search engine and come up and it's section four within there um, shows the tokenomics. So it shows the, the, the pie chart, if you like, with the, uh, with the different buckets that tokens get minted into. And uh, it's all very, very transparent on there. Um, so to come back to your question, no, we're not set up as a DAO right now. The tokens is a the token does act as a as a governance token as well. So there is um, you know so you know we quite often have proposals um, uh, on into um, our network from our token holders. We put proposals in there ourselves if there's going to be you know big changes we're suggesting or you know uh, projects we want to work on whatever it's going to look like. Um, mm -hmm. um, people are able to vote on that. So there is there is um, there is governance uh, within there, but. You know, the, um, we're not set up as a DAO. We are a core team at present, mm -hmm. um, and um, you know that will that will very likely continue for uh, at least I would say the next kind of well for twenty twenty four within that. And then, yeah, absolutely, we want to we want to decentralize. But I think it's 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 important from a kind of um, initially when you're kind of setting up and you've got that speed is you kind of need that core team in place in, in my opinion right so i know there will yeah, be different opinions out there um but you need those decisions to be made you need those you know to that strategy to be made and if you go like pure dow from the beginning i think that's 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 quite it's ambitious but it's quite difficult to do that and that can actually slow uh things down so we do know other projects where it's it's you know the have been in a the kind of dow setup is almost kind of uh comes a bit of a kind of red tape exercise to get um, things done. Uh, and I think that that may have kind of hampered the speed that they've uh, been able to, to kind of achieve their vision, if you like. So that's just my own personal opinion. Like I said, there'll be there'll be different opinions there. Um, but mm -hmm. importantly, the token is, um, you know, kind of governance within that. And then, yeah, of course. you know, and, that, and you know, you're absolutely right in that, you know, we're we're a proof of stake network. Um, so that's lots of independent token holders that are, you know, securing that network by um, locking their value into into that. The validators are, are independent um, as well. Um, so there's, you know, that's the, the kind of decentralization of the, of the blockchain um, itself. Um, for Kudos Intercloud, that's a bit different because, you know, we're not saying it's a decentralized cloud um, yet. Um, it's a, you know it's a distributed cloud um, for the for mm -hmm. the kind of reasons that um, I've mentioned. So you know we have our ambitions to to work towards that decentralization, but it's a, but it's a really tough thing to do. So if I kind of just give you one example, if um, you know a if we if a, a gaming PC right, I've got a gaming PC next to me right here right. It's got a, it's got a nice graphics card in there, nice yeah Nvidia. of course. 3080, I think it is, um, and um, yeah, it's a uh, it's yeah, really really cool GPU. I, I'd love to put that on and earn some money there from uh, from from compute. Um, but that this machine might go off, right? I haven't got two separate power feeds coming into it to to make sure that it never turns off. Um, my electricity price might go up, and I might decide actually I'm just going to turn this off. Um, mm -hmm. You know, my my local network might go down. I've got fiber coming into into the house, mm -hmm. but you know, it has outages at time. So they, they don't have the level of uptime and reliability. Um, the bandwidth is smaller coming into here than it would be coming into a data center. So there's, there's, there's things that make it very different. So if you're if you're on the other end, if you're the person that's got that workload that needs to be sent out and executed, um, then the majority of those available workloads now that we can we can monetize over the network are not suitable for, for, for those kind of um, end devices yet. Um, but if we look to something like um, SETI at home, um, these uh, kind of large scientific projects, simulations, those kind of things, where they don't need to have 
local storage. Um, they can automatically redistribute. So if one node goes down, it just flips over because they're not having to carry the storage with it. They just need that kind of processing power. Then, you know, that is very suitable to these types of devices. Um, and, you know, that's something that we'll kind of bring in later. So it's really a case of we need to support the, um, the, the, the alternative types of workloads out there to then bring on those, those, those types of devices. Mm -hmm. Yeah, now let's talk uh, something that I'm sure is, is, at least in the old school crypto world, is definitely like a, I guess, a common like fantasy scenario or like worst case fantasy scenario of like the censorship thing. And it's like when people talk about what happens if people want to take down Bitcoin, you can't take down Bitcoin. And then you have the whole, you know, open source decentralized development. And then you have the whole, okay, well, then you got to go after miners. And then China did ban a, a lot mm -hmm. of mining and then the miners disappeared and just popped up somewhere else and the network kept you know had some i wouldn't call them outages but had some delays and then eventually kept going and um there's a lot of argumentation on this it maybe not as fashionable today as it was back back in my day but it still is something that you know is kind of important and so um i guess let's present uh two different scenarios right one is the kudos of today and the other is the, the idealized kudos of the hopefully relatively near future like let next few years um so if a let's just talk at the highest level of like what about a, a state actor if for example um some financial let's just for hypothetical purposes say something like zcash moves to proof of stake and then all zcash validators are for the most part they use kudos to run because they want censorship resistant transactions and at some point um a state actor says you know what this is not good. We need to stop the network. And then they were like, oh, guess what? We can't because it's distributed across, you know, a whole bunch of nodes. Where are those nodes hosted? Oh, well, they're like a third of them on AWS, but then two thirds of them are on things like Kudos. And then they're like, okay, now we know what we have to do. We have to stop these guys. So then you get like a cease and desist letter. The Kudos core team gets a cease and desist letter. You must immediately stop servicing these nodes or you know, face consequences kind of thing. What's the short term, like today, like literally tomorrow, you wake up, it's your worst nightmare, right? Kind of thing. And then the three or four, whatever years from now, version of that scenario. Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a really good question. I mean, I think um, yeah, if we think about Bitcoin is, you know, the, 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 the purpose of Bitcoin, or at least the original purpose, I know it's kind of moved on slightly, was to become digital cash, right? Mm -hmm, um, your, 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 your channel here is named after it, right? So it's, this, so, so, you know, um, it's, it's to become the, uh, the, the finance chain, if you, if you want to look at it in, in that way. And so um, the, the decentralization that you get from proof of work network, um, and that there's nobody to, 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 to write an email to, to say, please close it down because it's just code, uh, it's on there. Um, yeah, absolutely see that kudos is not trying to be a digital cash, right? We're not trying to be a currency for people. It's, uh, you know, the, 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 the coin itself or the token itself serves a utility within the platform or multiple utilities within the platform for, um, uh, to enable compute transactions right, between the buyer and, uh, and the seller um, uh, on that. So it has a different purpose, which is why we felt like we didn't need to go down the, the, the proof of uh, uh, work route and we could do it on proof of stake. I mean, there's energy efficiencies and everything like that on that, which is a good, mm -hmm. a good story. But, you know, ultimately we needed a network that had hyper, um, uh, high throughput uh, transactions and, and low cost transactional costs, right? Because that's, that's, mm -hmm. that's what enable all of these different microtransactions. So um, that was our view on there. Now to come back to your point on the, what if um, the US government came through and said, we want you to um, close down the service to all of these kind of validators that are running on you. Um, now, we can't actually, if you, if you think for it, so we can't mm -hmm. see what that end user is doing on those servers. We have no access to that, right? We're providing infrastructure as a service. Mm -hmm. um, and um you know so so one you know which ones are we closing down which which virtual machines are we closing down here because we don't actually know what people are doing uh, doing on them but when they're coming through they're they're kind of ticking a box that they agree to the you know to um the terms and conditions which you know is, basically means they're not doing anything illicit with that kind of computing uh, power um, but at the same time, we have no way, and that's the you know that's by purpose, by design, because that's security. We don't want to be seeing that 
go and be liable for, for seeing what's uh, what's going on there. So it's kind of part, and then underneath, like I said, it's it's a distributed network, so it's going into multiple different environments. It's not as if they can come and close down one environment and they've and they've they've they've, they've kind of you know um, remove the, the the problem that they're foreseeing. With, um, and um, so yeah, it's it, 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 it's a tricky one. What I would always say to kind of any network that is set up, you know, we we did this with our own validator set is. You know, whilst anyone that meets the minimum requirement can spin up a validator and become part of the network, right? They don't even need to talk to us. They can become part of the validator network just going through that process. You know, by it, by it in general, we we know who our validators are because we've had conversations with them. They've been interested to find out more about projects. So there's a there's a there's a kind of friendliness between them. You know, there's a relationship between all the validators. But you know, so we use that opportunity to say that we don't want any any more than uh, ten to fifteen percent of the validators on our network with any with the same underlying vendor right so you know um and we want to make sure that we we're in um we've got a good geographical spread as well so um you know if you're coming onto the network where where are you looking to host uh, well we could do it in either south africa or we could do it in sao paulo uh, brilliant all right we've got someone in sao paulo so please could you do it in south africa and that gives us a you know a different part of the globe um, you know, which providers are you doing this with? Oh, we're actually going to do this as uh, bare brilliant, and, and so on and so forth, right? So, so we, we've kind of got, a, we've had a, a level of uh, oversight to that. We're not making the decisions for them. We're just, you know, providing a bit of guidance on there based on, you know, what we know is is already on the network. So again, it would come down the same if if we were actively working with another layer one protocol. And uh, they they decide that yeah, kudos into cloud would actually be a really good one. They can promote to to their validator community of where mm -hmm. to spin up. We would we would advise exactly the same thing. Do not put more than kind of ten to fifteen percent uh, through through kudos or kudos into cloud. Maybe you could maybe you could increase that slightly because it's distributed underneath. You've got different vendors, mm -hmm. um, but we would still you know recommend um, um, you know having different paths out there for, for that reason. So I'm not sure if that answers or it doesn't answer your, your question. I know it's not kind of full response to the kind of uh, censorship on there. Um, mm -hmm. But you know, again, it comes back to that cloud network is not decentralized, it's distributed at the time being. So we need to do the best with what we can over a distributed network when it becomes decentralized in the future uh, and you are able to run nodes on different types of uh, end user devices or however that looks, you know, things evolve and the technology may change, um, then then I think we'll probably need to, you know, kind of revisit what you're asking there and, uh, and see how censorship proof it is. Yeah, absolutely. So what does the next few years, let's say five years, look like for Kudos? Yeah, I mean, I mean, for us, our, our full focus is, is just on um, making it as easy as possible for developers in lots of different chains to access the computing power they, they require. Mm -hmm. So that's the that's the kind of the north star for us um uh, or at least you know that's the the kind of uh, the value prop that we want to, to to bring to the blockchain ecosystem um and so the everything therefore in a strategy point of view is how do we get to that right how do we unlock support for, for further wallets how do we unlock support for further chains for further tokens uh, to really kind of break down those barriers at, at, at each stage um, it's a big task, of course, um, but you know that's um, that's kind of what we're set out, and we've already started to make really good progress um, there. And then, you know, if we're if we're not talking about necessarily the the intercloud um, products and compute, um, we're talking about actually people developing on our chain. Is you know what? Why are people developing on the Kudos blockchain? Um, you know, you've got ethereum out there you've got solana you've got polygon right which have got big you know communities big liquidity out there so why would why would you build on another layer one and i think it it really just comes back to the the whole uh interoperability and, and, and compute uh, part again right so these applications as they as they grow in usership user base um as they grow in maturity as these as these metaverses and as these games get more and more sophisticated in their graphics and they need even more infrastructure underneath and they, those uh, infrastructure needs to be spread all around the world to be close to, to to customers is that we have an advantage of the fact that you can directly connect into um, that network from the blockchain from our blockchain itself so yeah that's um that's that's at least our focus over the next uh, kind of year or two uh, uh joel <laughs> and then and then who knows right this this pace this space moves so quickly 
um, that you know there may be something else that comes into it. Um, but I think it's always going to come back to that core, which is providing scalable compute. Yeah, that's fantastic. Well, um, this has been a, quite the enlightening chat. Where can people follow you in Kudos to find out more in the future? Yeah, so 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 drop into our Telegram, our X, um, um, you know, communities as well. So just just search Kudos. So C U D O S. Um, you'll be able to find them. We've got this. We've got a really active Discord um, server as well. Again, just search Kudos, and you'll it's open. So you'll be able to find that. Um, if you want to talk to me uh, directly, then feel free to to drop a message to Kudo Pete, um, and that's the same on X as it is on uh, Telegram. Um, but yeah, we've got we've got you know a lot of the team that are within the the kind of main community channels um, as well, and we're always keen to always keen to you know talk, speak uh, wherever we can. So um, I was going to say uh, smash that like button. Then I was uh, I was on the other side. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Then the smash the like button, which does not exist at the time of this recording, but when you're watching, is definitely well. <laughs> But no, it's been it's been great it's been great to to be here. So thank you very much for uh, for inviting me along today. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for being on. Uh, all right, well, you have a good one, huh? Thank you very much, Joe. It's a pleasure speaking to you.